Hello and welcome to this Revision Monkey video on the required practicals that are going to be in the 2022 Chemistry Paper 2 exam. And this video is for the AQA specification and it's for separate chemistry, otherwise known as triple chemistry in some schools. And this is for the higher tier students. So the required practicals they've asked you to focus on are rate of reaction and identifying ions so those are the required practicals covered in the rest of this video also have a look out in the description because I'll add there a link for the key content that you need to know for this paper and I'll also put some questions in there for you to practice on these required practicals rates of reaction required practical when wanting to calculate the rate of a reaction you might need to use one of these two equations. The first one says the rate of reaction can be calculated by the amount of reactant used up over time. And the second one is the amount of product made over time. So we're going to design some investigations using these two equations. Now there are several factors that you may be asked about in the exam that affect the rate of reaction. Those include temperature, concentration, and surface area. So you may well be designing experiment and changing any one of these three things. So that would be your independent variable. And if you change temperature, for example, you need to keep concentration and surface area of your reactants the same. And the same goes if you are selecting a different independent variable. One of them you change and the other two you have to keep the same. There are several different practicals that you can do to calculate rate of reaction and any one of these may come up in the exam. So this first one focuses on the amount of product made over time and the independent variable that we're going to change is concentration. So we'd measure 50 ml of 0.1 molar hydrochloric acid using a measuring cylinder and pour it into a conical flask. We'd place for example one centimetre of magnesium into the conical flask attach a gas syringe and start a timer. So in here we'd have our acid and our piece of magnesium which you should know is going to create hydrogen gas. To calculate the rate of reaction in this experiment we could record the volume of gas produced at regular intervals for example every 30 seconds for five minutes and as gas is produced by the reaction the gas syringe will move outwards and you can measure the volume of gas produced. Do not write amount, you must use the word volume. Then we would plot the volume of gas produced against time on a graph and we can use this to calculate the mean rate of reaction and I'll go through how we do this later on. We then repeat the experiment for the following concentrations of acid. So this will be our independent variable, the concentrations of acid. The dependent variable would be our volume of gas, which we then turn into our rate of reaction down here. And important control variables are things such as the volume of acid that we are using, the length of magnesium that we're using, and things such as temperature as well. As in all experiments, it's also really important to talk about the fact that you're going to repeat the experiment three times and calculate a mean for each concentration of acid that you're using. So a different practical setup now, but still looking at how concentration affects the rate of reaction. This time, this focuses on the equation, the amount of reactant used over time. So we start off by placing a conical flask on a balance and zeroing the balance. We would then measure 50 ml of 0.1 molar hydrochloric acid and pour this into the conical flask. And we then place one centimetre of magnesium into the conical flask and start a timer. We take the initial reading on the balance as well. So we're starting off with a mass of 25 grams. Now again we're using magnesium and acid so we're producing a gas. And because we have no bung on the conical flask that gas is going to be allowed to escape out of the conical flask. And in doing so, because mass is escaping from the system, the reading on the balance is going to go down. So to calculate the rate of reaction, we can record the mass on the balance every 30 seconds. So we'd wait 30 seconds, write down the new mass, another 30 seconds, 
again writing down the mass and so on and so on. And then we plot the mass against time on a graph and we can calculate the mean rate of reaction. We'd repeat this experiment for the following concentrations of acid, 0.5 molar, 0.7 molar and 1 molar and as always is good practice right at the end that you're going to repeat it three times for each concentration and calculate a mean. A third practical that you might see in your exam again answering the same question we're changing concentration and measuring the rate of reaction is when you draw a black cross on a white tile or piece of paper and place a conical flask on top. We'd measure 50 mils of 0.1 molar hydrochloric acid using a measuring cylinder and pour that into the flask and we'd also measure 50 mils of sodium thiosulfate using a measuring cylinder and pour that in the flask as well. So you can see at the moment when we've put the acid and sodium thiosulfate in we can still see the cross because the solution is colourless. However gradually over time a precipitate will form to make the solution go cloudy and at that point we will no longer be able to see the cross. So you can see now when the solution has gone cloudy we can no longer see the cross and we then record the time it takes for the cross to completely disappear. Obviously this is subject to error because different humans will have a different opinion on the exact time that the cross has disappeared. We repeat the experiment for the following concentrations of acid 0 0.5, 0 0.75 and 1 molar and for this one because we're not measuring the amount of reactant used or the amount of product made over time we're simply looking for the time it takes for a colour change we could use the equation rate equals a thousand divided by time to calculate a rate of reaction for each concentration that we're using. So with the results of a rate of reaction experiment you may well be asked to draw a graph or do some calculations using a graph that's provided to you. So let's look at this graph here first of all. This might be a graph that we might have drawn from the first experiment whereby we're measuring the volume of gas produced over time. A few things about rate of reaction graphs to start off with then. The steeper the gradient the faster the rate of reaction. So you can see this first section here is really steep. Then a shallower gradient here, so the rate of reaction is slowing down. And at this point here, where the graph starts to level out, the reaction has actually stopped. And we know that because if you read off the graph here, no more gas is being produced. So here are some common questions that you're asked. One here says, what is the mean rate of reaction? So to calculate this from the graph, you would find out the point where the reaction stops draw a line from the x-axis up to that point and then a line across to the y-axis and you would read off from the bottom the time that it took so 15 seconds because from 0 to here is 15 seconds and the volume of gas produced in that time from the 0 up to here so 34 approximately and then we would calculate that by doing 34 divided by 15 giving us an answer of 2.3 centimetres cubed per second. We always do the y divided by the x in our calculations and we get the units for rate by reading them off the graph. Centimetres cubed divided by seconds is what we've done so those are our units. They could also ask for a mean rate of reaction for a particular time point. For example what is the mean rate of reaction between 4 and 12 seconds and in that case at time point 4 you draw a dotted line up and across to the y-axis you do the same for 12 and then you would read off between those two sections so between 4 and 12 we've got a time of 8 seconds and between our two markers on the y-axis here we have a volume of gas produced of 12.5 centimetres cubed so to calculate the rate of reaction, again we do the y divided by the x, so our y value is our 12.5 divided by our x value of 8 seconds. 12.5 divided by 8 gives us for that section of the graph a mean rate of reaction of 1.6 centimetres cubed per second. And finally a calculation for higher tier only, 
So if you're doing foundation, you can skip to the next required practical. This one says, what is the rate of reaction at eight seconds? So this is exactly at this time point here. What is the rate of reaction? And to do that, you need to draw a tangent on your graph, which is a straight line as close to the line as possible at that point, like the one I've just drawn on there. Now, there will be some leeway in your exam, but try and get it as close as possible and following the same pattern as closely as you can. And then look on your gradient line where the line crosses the grid at some sensible points. For example, here it crosses in the corner and down here. Then we draw dotted lines to make a triangle between those two. And again, we're going to do the change in y, which is this bit, divided by the change in x to calculate our gradient. So we do 15 divided by 10 to calculate the rate of reaction at that exact point as 1.5 centimetres cubed per second. Identifying ions required practical for separate science only. In this required practical, there are lots of different tests to remember for different ions. So why would we need to test for ions? Well, if we had this unknown compound here, we would be able to do a variety of tests to identify exactly what that compound was made of. So this is the type of question you might be asked. Describe the test you'd carry out to identify the ionic compound. Remembering back from paper one, ionic compounds are metals and non-metals bonded together. So for example, you could have calcium sulfate. Calcium ions are the metal bonding with the sulfate ions. You could have sodium chloride or magnesium carbonate, magnesium bromide, potassium iodide or copper sulfate. So there's so many different ones that you could have and these are just a few examples. With this compound we have no idea, apart from the fact that it's white, we have no idea what it's made up of. So you're going to have to do a variety of tests to work out what the positive ion is and we call this the cation and what the negative ion is, and we call this the anion. Once you've worked out what both things are, you can then name the compound. So first of all, let's go through the test for cations, which are the positive ions. One thing that you can do to test for the metal ions, which are the positive ions, is to do flame tests. You'd need a wire loop made of an unreactive metal, for example, platinum, and you'd need to clean the loop by dipping it in dilute hydrochloric acid and then putting it in a blue flame until it burns without any colour. You then allow the wire to cool and then dip it in the sample that you are testing, for example the white powder from the previous page. You then put your loop with your unknown sample back into a blue flame. If the flame was orange red in colour that would indicate the metal iron was calcium. If the flame was yellow, that indicates sodium. If the flame was crimson, that would indicate lithium. A lilac flame would show you'd have potassium. And a green flame would show you that the cation was copper. Flame tests, however, are not the only tests that can be used to identify cations. There is another test whereby you add sodium hydroxide to your unknown ionic compound. So we've got a conical flask here or can you use a beaker or a test tube and you have sodium hydroxide and your unknown powder inside. A precipitate will form and that's because you will make an insoluble hydroxide. So precipitate is a solid that's suspended in the solution because this hydroxide does not dissolve. The colour of the precipitate will then help you identify the cation. If a blue precipitate forms when you add sodium hydroxide you have identified copper in the compound. If a green precipitate forms you've identified iron 2 and the 2 just means you're talking about Fe2+, remembering that transition metals can make ions with different charges, because Fe3+, or iron 3 makes a different colour precipitate. So iron 2 makes green and iron 3 makes brown. 
Now, if you remember that transition metals form coloured compound, which is content for paper one especially, then you'll remember that all the ones that are coloured are transition metals. So copper blue, iron two green and iron three brown. If, however, your unknown compound contains calcium, magnesium or aluminium, then a white precipitate will be formed. Because all of these are white, you'd need to do further tests to find out whether it's actually calcium, magnesium or aluminium you've got. Now, to determine if you've got aluminium or not, you can add sodium hydroxide in excess to the solution. And with aluminium, if you add excess sodium hydroxide, it turns colourless because the precipitate that you've just made dissolves back in the solution. So that will help you identify the aluminium. For the other two, you may need to do a flame test and if it comes up as orange red, you know then you've got your calcium. To remember the difference then between these white precipitates, if you remember that calcium and magnesium are in group two, and the aluminium being in group three is the one that does something different. Okay, So the group three one is the one that will disappear when you add excess sodium hydroxide. Now let's look at the test for anions, which are the negative ions. First of all, we'll look at testing for carbonates. So that's if the second part of your compound was CO3. So for this test, you would place a spatula of your unknown compound in a test tube and add dilute acid. So we'd have our unknown compound in the bottom and acid added on top. We then add a bung and delivery tube and connect to a test tube containing lime water. If carbonate ions are present, then carbon dioxide will be released and the lime water will turn cloudy like shown in the image there. If you had a negative result for the carbonates, you might want to then test to see if your compound contained a halide ion. And the three that you need to be aware of for your exam are chloride, bromide and iodide. So if you remember, halide ions are from group seven of the periodic table where you find the halogens. So to test for these halides, you would add a few drops of dilute nitric acid and a few drops of silver nitrate. So for the chloride ions first of all I'll show you the ionic equation. The silver ions from the silver nitrate react with the chloride ions if they're present to form silver chloride and if chloride ions are present the silver chloride is a white precipitate. For the bromide ions again silver ions would react with the bromide ions to make silver bromide but this time that is a cream precipitate and if iodide ions were present that would form a yellow precipitate. Now to help you remember if you think about the periodic table you can think of the precipitate getting darker as you go down the periodic table. So white precipitate for chloride ions, cream for bromide and yellow for iodide. So if you've got negative results for carbonates and halides, you might want to finally test to see if you have sulfate ions in your compound. So to test for sulfates, you would have your unknown compound in a test tube. And you'd add some hydrochloric acid and some barium chloride. And if sulfate ions are present, a white precipitate will form. And this is because barium sulfate is being formed. So the barium ions from the barium chloride react with the sulfate ions if they are present to form barium sulfate. 